Every day, every single day, things are happening in the world of deals and deal makers. And there's never enough time to keep up with every company, transaction, announcement, or whatever. It's just exhausting. And we have a new product to help fix that. This is Axios Pro Deals, a new premium subscription product bringing you tailor-made insights like never before. For the last five years, Axios has helped deal professionals navigate the whole deal landscape with ProRata. With Axios Pro Deals, we're diving deeper into the industries that matter most to you. You just want stories on fintech? There's a newsletter for that. Medtech deals? We've got you covered. The future of retail? We'll guide you. With Axios Pro Deals, you're going to be getting all of this industry-specific insight and expert analysis at a level you simply can't get anywhere else. So if you're a venture capitalist, private equity investor, banker, trader, founder, executive, anyone who cares about deals, Axios Pro is what you need to help you understand what matters and why. Start your free trial today at AxiosPro.com. Five years ago, we started Axios with the mission to get you smarter, faster on topics that matter. We get you smarter about national topics like tech, politics, and sports. We make you smarter about your community with Axios Local. And now we want to get you smarter, faster about your job with Axios Pro. Finding the right news and information for your work can be daunting. And most of the time when you do find what you need, the information is just too long and too boring. You should be using your time to make decisions not sorting through noise. Axios Pro is here to help you make smarter decisions faster. Our deeply sourced reporters will give you actionable intelligence that's delivered in a way that's quick and easy to read. No fluff, just the good stuff. With Axios Pro, we're gonna focus on the industries that matter to you. Each industry will have its own dedicated team of resources and reporters who know these industries inside and out. Every weekday will bring you important information and analysis that you can't get anywhere else. And guess what? This is just the beginning. Start your free trial at AxiosPro.com. Welcome to our virtual event, Preparing for the Next Pandemic. I'm Tina Reed, Healthcare Editor at Axios, and I'm coming to you today from Arlington, Virginia. Welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. You can join the conversation today on Twitter with at Axios, and hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, we will look at how combating antimicrobial resistance is vital to strengthening our healthcare system and preparing for the next pandemic. Our first guest is the Indiana Senator Todd Young joining us from Washington, DC. Welcome, Senator Young. Tina, thanks for having me. So we're here today to talk about the issue of superbugs, and I wanted to start out by just asking, how did this first get on your radar? You know, I began hearing about this from constituents. Uh, of course, we've, we've been going through a global pandemic, and all eyes have been focused on, on uh, not only that health risk, but the risk of other pathogens uh, around the world. And, and uh, as we try and up our game with respect to health security, I began hearing a lot uh, about uh, this problem of antimicrobial resistance uh, that's killing you know, a person every 15 minutes. And that certainly caught my attention and I uh, decided to uh, devote some efforts working with one of my colleagues uh, to see if there are uh, tools that we can bring to bear uh, as instruments of public policy to, uh, to prevent those deaths. Well, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what you were seeing happening in the marketplace. Um, you know, just to set the scene, the FDA approved 15 antibiotics uh, from 2010 to 2019. 
The companies behind five of those drugs have either declared bankruptcy or have been sold for pennies on the dollar of their initial valuation. So clearly we don't have a lot going on in the pipeline. Could you talk a little bit about why that that's so concerning? Yeah, this really gets to the heart of the problem, Tina, which is uh, the, currently the federal government has, has an outdated model uh, in, in compensating the most innovative companies uh, who try and bring to bear the best science and, and uh, address uh, these challenges. Uh, but they end up not really paying for innovation. And instead, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're paying in, in, in ways that uh, uh, are reactive. You know, think of it as a, a fire extinguisher as, as opposed to on the front end, figuring out how much value the public could get from innovation to protect us from an AMR resistant uh, bacteria strain and uh, then compensating innovators uh, in, in early in the process. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, reactiveness and, and payment after the fact. And, and sometimes you find very innovative uh, scientists and companies who are attempting to help us prevent uh, the outbreaks of, of these uh, uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, pathogens. Uh, but they're just unable to sustain themselves because there hasn't yet been an outbreak. So we need to go ahead and pay the innovators on the front end, have their solutions off the shelf that we can pull off if ever needed. So let's move into talking a little bit about what you think the solution for that might be. Um, you co-introduced the Pasteur Act. What would that do? So this would move us away uh, from the sort of model that I just explained towards a subscription-based model. You know, I, I referenced a fire extinguisher. I guess that could be one model. Think of this as, as maybe the Netflix uh, model where the federal government identifies what that public health value is. Uh, they work with innovators and, and companies that might have the ability to uh, develop uh, treatments and, and uh, preventative measures to uh, prevent, you know, a public health crisis uh, should that antimicrobial resistant pathogen find its way to our shores. And, and uh, we go ahead and pay that up front. Of course, that would cost more money up front uh, uh, from the American taxpayers. But in the end, uh, all it takes is, is one major outbreak to not only lead to uh, the loss of thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps many, many more lives lost, but uh, also uh, very, very expensive uh, expenditures uh, to our economy and, and uh, to the federal budget to deal with it on the back end. So that's essentially uh, what the model is. Paired with that, Tina, is, is, is very important. We want to make sure that as we are investing this money in development of, of next generation uh, uh, solutions, we're also upping our game as it comes to uh, implementing the, the uh, best stewardship programs that prevent the over, uh, over prescription of some of these uh, antibiotics, uh, which then allows the bacteria to evolve and, and uh, uh, you know, could still threaten uh, U.S. citizens and others around the world. Can you dig a little deeper on the subscription model and, and exactly how this would incentivize uh, some of these biotechs um, and actually uh, create new antibiotics? Yeah, I, I, you know, what we're really doing is, is um, we're empowering our, uh, our leaders at, at uh, the Centers for Disease Control to work with innovators and uh, to pay for a reliable supply of uh, these novel antimicrobials uh, that are decoupled from, from the uh, volume of antimicrobials actually used. So right now we, we uh, pay for volume. We pay for the number of antimicrobials used. What we really need is to have an arsenal of treatments and prophylactic measures that we can take off the shelf. And we wanna pay for those, pay for successful drugs in the event that we ever need them. And in some cases we won't need them, but in other cases uh, it's, uh, you know, we're, ounce, we're investing in this ounce of prevention that is going to lead to great savings and a reduction of human costs down the road. So it is a major shift, and it's going to take 
frankly, some adjustment, a uh, shift in thinking for my colleagues and, and for others. We're no longer paying for volume. That's kind of the old model. Uh, instead, we want to pay for uh, success, successful uh, interventions. How much would this cost us? Well, you have to, uh, the way to think about it, the way I think about it is uh, the federal government only pays once. You pay for the subscription, you pay for the compound, the secret sauce, but then you don't have to continue to pay down the road because we already have as taxpayers, the intellectual property uh, for these things. But the more precise answer to your very good question, Tina, is this is something that will have to be uh, negotiated. Uh, between the innovators and um, our health professionals at uh, the, the CDC. Um, if we do this, if we head down this road, if we pass the Pasteur Act, which would empower uh, our best health minds uh, to go out and, and, and do what they do best, then we solve the core problem uh, that, is, that faces the um, uh, antibiotic uh, drug development uh, process. And, and that's the, the pressing need for innovative drugs that frankly don't have high sales potential as they're developed. Uh, and uh, we, we, we solve that problem, but when they are needed, uh, they have massive, massive value uh, to uh, American citizens and really people all around the world. And I guess, how do we pay for it? I should have asked that as well. Well, uh, we, we pay for it through uh, the authorization of, uh, of funding for the executive branch to work with these uh, innovative companies to identify uh, the core value. And then they draft contracts uh, that, that lay out, uh, lay out um, uh, payment for a reliable supply. So uh, uh, we, we merely em empower them to uh, go out and, and uh, engage in these negotiations with the promise of, of uh, compensation on the back end. And what do you think the path forward is for this, for this bill? Um, you know, what, what's the timeline of, of actually getting it passed? Uh, and what are your expectations uh, for what we should be watching with it moving forward? Well, Senator Bennett of, of Colorado and myself uh, are, I, I think it's probably fair to say we, we uh, are optimistic but uh, that doesn't mean we have 100% or 90% chance of passage. We're optimistic only because we're hearing a lot of uh, uh, chatter about receiving a lot of press attention and, and getting a lot of questions from our colleagues uh, about how we might get this done. Uh, I think there's a growing recognition that something like the Pasteur Act uh, to pay on the front end of the development process as opposed to waiting to, until disaster strikes uh, is, is urgently needed. And because of that, I think as we approach year's end, uh, working with Representatives Doyle and uh, Mike Ferguson in the House of Representatives, we're going to give it a strong push. And to the extent there are individuals who, who are watching this and they feel like this is a, a good idea for federal government to head in this direction, I, I would invite people to uh, contact their member of Congress. But I think we've got a, a really decent shot of, of getting this done before year's end, which would be transformative. And the HHS secretary didn't quite endorse it um, last week, but did speak uh, quite highly of the Pastor Act. So do you expect that this could get the president's signature? I do. I do. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the HHS secretary is... is open to and even uh, probably supportive of this solution. To the extent others, other solutions might be offered, uh, I think he would remain open to that as well, which is why they haven't gravitated towards a, a particular bill. But um, listen, the administration knows uh, as well as anyone that uh, we, we need, last thing we need right now is yet another and distinct health disaster from the global pandemic we've just been through. And, and I have to say, this problem that we're speaking to is only worsened in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, as, as so many doctors have pr been prescribing antibiotics, uh, and uh, we've seen resistance grow uh, to antibiotic treatments around the world. Well, thank you so much, Senator Young, for joining Axios today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tina.
And next, we have a view from the top segment with my colleague, Chris Freight. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Freight. Thank you to our sponsor, Beatrice, for making this conversation possible. And joining me now is Beatrice's head of global policy, Erica Satterway. Erica, welcome to Axios. Thank you so much, Chris. So happy to be here. And I want to start this conversation by talking a little bit about antimicrobial resistance or AMR. I think we've heard a, a little bit about that. I think many of us, because it's really growing at an alarming rate. And I'm wondering why and what happens if we don't stop it? Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. And happy to first level set a little bit about the current impact of AMR. AMR is a leading global cause of death. A comprehensive analysis that came out in February 22 in The Lancet showed us that based on 2019 data, annual deaths associated with bacterial AMR were nearly 5 million, 1.27 million of which were directly attributable to AMR. This put bacterial AMR squarely in the top three causes of death after heart disease and stroke in 2019. And young children in particular are particularly at risk. Um, globally, one in five deaths attributable to AMR are in this age range. And as a mom of two kids in this demographic, that is absolutely horrifying and we need to do better. Why is this okay, happening? That... Why is it accelerating? Um, inappropriate use of existing antibiotics, as well as lack of access to appropriate antibiotics. And what happens if we don't stop it? Um, the consequences of AMR continuing to spread are absolutely catastrophic. Not only do we lose our ability to address infections um, like pneumonia or sepsis, it also means that modern medicine that relies on the preventive use of antibiotics to prevent infection, whether that's chemotherapy for cancer, um, common surgeries like C-sections or hip replacements, we lose our ability to do all of that. Wow. Okay. So that sounds pretty awful. So what do we do to stop it? We can stop it, right? We can. Yes. We can begin by preventing infections in the first place. Um, so by furthering efforts around hygiene, sanitation, hospital-based infection control, and vaccination, um, both for bacterial pathogens directly, as well as for viral infections to stop the inappropriate use or overuse of antibiotics. Second, on that point, antibiotic stewardship. This means we need to be appropriately using the existing antibiotics we have, minimizing their use when they're not appropriate, like for viral infections, as well as ensuring that when we do use them, we're using the right way, the right antibiotic, the right dose, the right amount of time. And to do that, access to diagnostics and proper education, both for healthcare workers and for patients, is really critical. Third, we need collaboration. This is something that no company or entity can tackle on their own. Stakeholders across the board, whether industry, NGOs, governments, we all need to work together with no silos to find new ways to meet these unmet needs, whether that's um, developing new antibiotics, whether that's tackling appropriate use, we need to work together. Um, at Beatrice, we really recognize our responsibility in this space as one of the leading players. We have around 90 antibiotics in our global portfolio, and we're founding members of the AMR Industry Alliance, which is a really unique collaboration bringing together stakeholders from diagnostics, biotechs, generics, and innovator industry to really tackle these barriers together. Finally, and this point is not made frequently enough, ensuring availability and access to many different antibiotics is so critical. Restricting access to antibiotics when they are appropriate is not going to help because infections are going to continue to spread. Ensuring market viability for as many antibiotics as we can is so important because access to the right antibiotic at the right time is key. And I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the economics of this problem, because I, I imagine there's a lot uh, in market viability. You know, kind of I'm curious, how does market viability influence tackling this problem and combating AMR? Yes, it's such an important question. Many antibiotics are old and have been available as generics for many years. And in theory, this is wonderful. <laughs> But in practice, many antibiotics have become really highly commoditized. What that means is that prices are so low for these life-saving essential medicines that in many cases, it's no longer viable for the company to continue making or selling them. This can lead to an unhealthy concentration in the market um, that in turn can lead to a high risk of supply disruption. 
This is not a unique problem for antibiotics. This is a challenge that we see playing out for many older generic medicines. The unique dynamic here for antibiotics, though, is that preserving access to many different antibiotics is absolutely critical to ensure that doctors and patients have access to the right product to treat the infection in case of this infection that, that is um, resistant to certain types of antibiotics. So policymakers and payers really need to recognize that the market incentives and the economics are so critical to ensuring that we have access. And then it goes beyond just new product introductions that we're really looking at older products as well. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about AMR in relation to pandemic preparedness, because I think that came up uh, a lot during the most recent pandemic. And I'm wondering, can as governments look ahead, what should they do? And, and for that matter, what should they not do when it comes to combating AMR and making sure it's not a driving factor in the next global pandemic? Yes, terrific question. Um, pandemic preparedness is really all encompassing. It means it gives us an opportunity to really ensure our health systems are fit for purpose and our communities are better equipped to manage all types of infectious disease. We all, including governments, must take AMR so seriously because this is not a potential future issue. This is an issue that is here with us today. It is a major driver of disease and death and it has catastrophic potential if we do not address it. One of the main learnings that we have from COVID is that global problems need global solutions, but that local policies are the difference between life and death. So globally, governments must work together on AMR. Surveillance networks, data sharing, ensuring global supply chains can help ensure broad and equitable access to diagnostics and medicines, but also locally, governments must ensure that policies they put in place are really supportive of efforts to address AMR, whether that's about appropriate use or whether that's about market viability for older mm -hmm. and newer medicines. And governments at all levels need to work together with industry, with NGOs, with civil society to make sure that policies don't have unintended consequences. Patients also have a role to play in making sure they're using antimicrobials appropriately and taking these decisions seriously. We as a global healthcare company are fully dedicated to participating in addressing AMR both through our own work and with policymakers because collaboration is really the key here. It's so critical. And we'll have to leave it there. Erica Satterway is the head of global policy for Beatrice. Erica, thank you so much for joining Axios. Thank you so much, Chris. And now, your next segment. Thanks, Chris. Our final guest is the CDC's Deputy Director for Program Improvement in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, Dr. Arjun Srinivasan, joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Hello, Dr. Srinivasan. Hey, Tina, how are you? Thanks for having me. Well, I wanted to start with the big picture of this threat that's been building for a while. And so I wanted to just start really simply by talking about what do we mean when we talk about antibiotic resistance or superbugs? You know, what we quite simply mean when we use that term antibiotic resistance, and it's for bacteria and for fungal pathogens as well, is this is a bacteria or a fungus that we cannot treat with the antibiotic or the antifungal that is recommended as the first line treatment. And what that means is that we have to use treatments that are not first line. So they're either uh, they're more toxic or more expensive than what we would like to use. And in some cases, it means we simply have no therapies at all. These are uh, organisms that have developed resistance to everything that we have to throw at them. And so we cannot treat them with any of the agents that we currently have. Wow, that sounds really scary. How big of a threat was this uh, before the pandemic even began? It was a huge threat before the pandemic, and this has been something that, as you mentioned and alluded to, and as we've heard, has been a problem for a long, long time and a growing problem for a very long time. You know, we published a, a report several years ago uh, demonstrating that the, there were roughly 3 million infections per year. This was a report published in 2019 with data from 2017, but about 3 million infections per year caused by these uh, bacteria and and fungi that are not treatable, not responsive to the recommended therapy for them. Over 30,000 patients per year 
died in the United States. And those are U.S. numbers, right? So it's 3 million infections and 30,000 deaths just in the United States. Uh, and we know that the, those numbers are even higher. Uh, if you look at other countries around the world, the number of infections and deaths rises into the many, many millions. So this is a huge problem uh, that has been present for quite some time. Uh, but the good news is, is that before the pandemic, we were actually seeing some progress uh, in reducing some of these infections, especially the ones that occur in healthcare settings. Okay, so you, you said before the pandemic. So let's talk about yeah. what happened during the pandemic. I know there was this report from the CDC in July showing there was a reversal of progress. Can you talk a little bit about the findings? Yeah. That's exactly right. So that's that cliffhanger there. Uh, we were seeing progress, really some, some major gains in reducing these infections before the pandemic. And, and this is something that I think it's it's hard to under uh, understate how important those gains were because you know there were a lot of people who said, oh, there's nothing you can do. Once resistance begins to develop, it'll just happen and it'll grow and grow and we can never turn turn that tide, if you will. And what we showed is, no, that's not true. If you focus on this problem, if you implement the best practices that we know work, you can actually see reductions in these resistant infections. However, what we saw during the pandemic was, as you just mentioned, a reversal of many of those gains. There were increases in infection, uh, in infections across the board for the resistant pathogens that are most problematic in healthcare. And what's just as, a, and, and we saw increases by an average of about 15% for those resistant infections and those healthcare pathogens. And what's just as concerning is in addition to seeing increases for the pathogens where we had data, we had no data at all to even know what had happened to half of the threat, uh, the resistant threats that we monitor in that report because the data systems were so disrupted by the pandemic uh, that we literally have no idea what happened to those pathogens during the pandemic. So uh, this is you know, alarming to all of us on multiple fronts, both uh, alarming for what we do know about and equally alarming for the data that we simply don't have. So what happened during the pandemic to contribute to these increases? Yeah, you know, it's it's a variety of different factors, and they are factors that we would expect to see in any pandemic, right? You have a large number of patients who are ill, who need medical care. Many of those patients are are quite ill. You know, what we saw during COVID was a was a high severity of illness. Patients in the hospital for a long length of time, patients who need devices like catheters in their bloodstreams, uh, many of them needed to be on ventilators, and lots of transfers between, say, nursing homes and acute care hospitals. And what we know is that every one of those factors increases the risk of infections, uh, in increases the risk of transmission of those pathogens when they occur in healthcare settings. Uh, so all of those factors that we saw during COVID drove up these rates of resistance, drove up infections that happen in healthcare, which are often caused by resistant organisms. And it's the same types of things that we would expect to see in any future pandemic. So not only do we need to review our experience in COVID-19, I think this is really important for us to think about as we consider how we get ready for the next pandemic. So let's talk about some solutions. Uh, first, let's start with what are the tools that we have in our arsenal right now against these bugs and what do we still need? You know, there, there's a lot that we that we have now that we have currently and the things that we can do. You know, there are a lot of best practice interventions that are recommended, uh, several of which are effective against a broad host of these pathogens, particularly in healthcare. Things like uh, cleaning your hands, keeping the environment clean. Uh, in healthcare, following the types of precautions that are recommended, usually what we call contact precautions, right? Wearing gloves and a gown when you enter the room where these patients are uh, in the environment, in food delivery systems, it's cleaning that environment properly and using the right types of equipment. And all of those measures help reduce the spread of these organisms through the environment. And so what that means is that if somebody were to develop 
an infection with one of these resistant organisms, it will stay with that one person. It won't be spread to many other people. And those strategies are very effective, both within healthcare settings uh, and also out in the community. Uh, a great example is a pathogen called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a problem both in healthcare and in the community, right? And the types of things we say in the healthcare environment, we keep that setting clean. In the gym, it's the same thing. Keep that equipment clean, wipe it down when you're through with it, right? So environmental cleaning and in healthcare, the use of that type of protective equipment, very, very important to prevent the spread of organisms. There are also things that we can do to reduce the risks that that resistance is going to develop in the first place. And there, our primary strategy is to uh, improve the way that we use antibiotics. We know that antibiotics and antifungal agents are important selecting factors for resistance. They help fuel the fire of resistance. So when we optimize the way that we use those drugs and we give them only when they're needed and we give the right drug for the shortest duration that's effective, we help reduce that selective pressure. We deprive antimicrobial resistance of some of that fuel that it needs to thrive. So it's both uh, preventing the development of resistance uh, as well as uh, preventing the spread of resistance. There are other tools that we have as well. Vaccines are an important one. Uh, there are some vaccines that are directed against some of these pathogens themselves. And the streptococcus pneumonia vaccine is a great example of that. The launch of that strep pneumonia vaccine has actually reduced antibiotic resistance in streptococcus pneumonia because it has so dramatically reduced the number of those infections. We need more vaccines for these types of AR threats. The other place where vaccines can be really helpful is for vaccines for things like flu and COVID. Now, those are viral pathogens, so why am I mentioning them here? Well, oftentimes what happens is when people get a viral infection, they go to the doctor, the doctor may, not, may or may not know what's going on, and so they get an antibiotic that they don't need. If you're vaccinated against flu, if you're vaccinated against COVID, you won't get that illness, and you're less likely to get those unnecessary antibiotics. And there are also, we, we believe, a, 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 num a need for a number of really important innovations in this space as well. We think there are uh, better devices that we can use in hospitals. There are agents that we might be able to use to decolonize people who are uh, carrying some of these resistant organisms. These aren't things that we have yet, uh, as well as those new vaccines that I mentioned. We don't have them yet, but those are things we desperately need uh, in order to continue our, our fight against these uh, resistant pathogens. And what about the development of new antibiotics? Are, are we facing a world where we might run out of new antibiotics? And is there enough being done to create new options? Yeah, there, we are indeed facing that world. And I think that's something that all of us in infectious diseases worry about. There is a lot that's happening uh, and there's a lot of uh, necessary investments in, in creating new antibiotics. Uh, and just as important as we bring those new antibiotics online, we also have to work just as hard at improving the way that they're used. Dr. Srinivasan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Tina. Appreciate it. Thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. For the latest on antimicrobial resistance or to sign up for my vitals newsletter, visit axios.com slash newsletters or visit, visit us on the Axios app. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you on axios.com.